Thanks, Chuck. So just a few days ago, Tim said he wouldn't, wasn't going to be able to make it here. So he sent me some slides, of which I've not used very many. Um, so contrast-enhanced MRA, uh, as opposed to non-contrast. The aim here really with contrast enhanced is to reduce the T1 of the blood pool during the imaging of whichever vascular compartment you're looking at and reduce it such that it stands out from the background, usually fat. We usually image in first pass either dynamically but also nowadays certainly our group uses a lot of extended phase or steady state imaging. The main problem is the short passage of contrast through an arterial compartment which in the brain can be as little as four to six seconds and you're wanting to look at very small vessels so you've got to, always got to trade off with MR between temporal resolution and spatial resolution. So we want to, for instance, in the carotids to cover from the aortic arch to the circle of Willis, but we want isotropic voxels that we can reformat and see the small circle of Willis vessels. So the, the main st standby in MRA has been contrast with gadolinium-based contrast agents. And these were first introduced, well, first shown to be useful in 1983. This is a first patient with uh, Graham Bidder back in the Hammersmith Hospital in London with a brain tumour. What we wanted to do is wanted to drive the T1 of blood right down below that of the background tissue, particularly fat. So fat at, uh, has a T1 of about 270 milliseconds at 1.5 T, and we want to drive our blood pool down way below that so we've got good contrast. Can you have too much? We can have too much. If we put in too much gadolinium contrast, then although the T1 will be driven low, you've got to remember that there's also a T2 star effect, and the overall T1 signal is a combination of the T1 shortening, but also the T2 star. So as we uh, increase our concentration of gadolinium in the blood pool, we get increasing uh, T1 shortening, so we get increasing T1 signal, but up to a point, because here the T2 star takes over and it drives it right down. Okay, so that's relevant if, we, if we're giving neat gadolinium contrast uh, very quickly. When did gadolinium contrast enhanced MRA start? Well, I like to think it started with this paper uh, in The Lancet from a British group in Leeds, uh, Mohan Sivananthan and John Ridgway, uh, doing 2D contrast enhanced MRA, and Philippe uh, Dueck in Lyon was doing something very similar around the same time. But following that, then obviously the landmark papers are those from Martin Prince and his group looking at 3D contrast enhanced MRA with a 3D volume and 3D uh, acquisition of 3D Fourier transform. When we've got DSA, then we've got very, very fast temporal resolution. Okay, so we can image multiple phases during the passage of an iodine bolus of contrast through the vasculature very, very quickly. And we don't have a problem uh, with doing that. Of course, we are limited to one projection. We're only seeing a 2D image. With MR, this is our acquisition window, and it's much longer, generally. Um, it can, we can tailor it roughly to the blood pool arterial phase, uh, but we do get a 3D image at the end of it so we have something to show for that time that we've taken okay here's a nice renal MRA this is the first one we ever did in Glasgow 1998 um, and this was a revolution for us because up to that point we didn't have CT at that point we'd have had to have done a trans lumbar autogram putting a needle through the back of the patient into the aorta to get this kind of picture we could we didn't have radial um, puncture sets at that time and that was the only way we could have done this, but this was a revolution for us, just completely non-invasively and get a 3D e examination. So what are our objectives? Our objectives are to have the contrast medium in the vascular bed during sampling. We want to coordinate the peak enhancement with the acquisition of the case space center. You heard about case space earlier on, on from Chuck. And then we sample the peripheral part during the contrast tail. As an empirical rule, we inject contrast over about 50% of the, of the scan time. You've got to remember, we're uh, talking about arterial bed, we've injected into a vein, it's got to be chopped up by the heart, pushed through the pulmonary circulation, the bolus gets longer as it goes through that and comes out the other side. At different field strengths, our different contrast agents have different relaxivities, and remember as you go to higher field strengths, although the uh, relaxivities of the higher relaxivity agents still remain higher, the, the ratio, the relative amount of enhancement is not so great as we go up, so there's less, there's less advantage uh, from these high, high uh, relaxivity agents as we go up in field strength. Here we can see just what I showed in the graph earlier, that if we give a bolus of contrast, then we can drive our T1 uh, way, way down um, and bring it below that of skeletal muscle and fat, etc., and hopefully get good contrast. And end up with a, a nice 3D contrast enhanced MRA like this, 
which has got a nice little spike across here. This turned out to be a bulb that was flickering our MR scanner at the time, one Chuck showed earlier on. Just a reminder about K-space, that is the centre of K-space that determines our contrast and the peripheral lines of K-space that determine the edge definition. Okay, so there's a Fourier transform of the whole K-space data versus the central versus the peripheral. And in MR, in contrast-enhanced MR, then we have very, very sparse data. Luckily for us, we don't have to worry too much about it. We can sample the centre of the K-space and we can pretty much ignore a lot of the periphery and still get a very good uh, example, get a very good angiogram. In linear K-space, which is what we first started out with, lin sort of the sort of conventional way that we collect K-space, we collect each line. And of course, we're starting with the peripheral lines and we're only hitting the centre of K-space about halfway through the acquisition of the sequence. Okay. So everything up to that point uh, has been mainly peripheral. And that's, you know, if you're talking about multiple seconds of acquisition, uh, that can have a real impact on what you do in terms of how you con collect your contrast and how you time it to your bolus. So in the early days, this is our bolus of contrast coming through the vasculature with an arterial peak. If we're using a conventional uh, case space encoding, then of course it was here. So when I started doing this way back in the, in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, then we, had, uh, we only had uh, conventional case space encoding techniques. So if our scan time was 20 seconds, but our time to peak with, from our bolus arrival time that we'd calculate was, say, 24, we'd have to start our scan at 14 seconds, which meant that the first half of the scan was effectively wasted because there was no contrast there that was affecting the ultimate image. This led to uh, the idea that we would sample the center of case space earlier on, okay? So what we want to do here, instead of collecting our case space in the middle of the sequence, we want to front load that, and that will allow us then to move to what we call, we call using centric encoding, we can then move to fluoroscopic triggering. Okay, because then we can actually watch the contrast coming in and then start the scan when the contrast is in the right place. So the idea here is that we do this central line first, and then we go either side all the way out and to the edges of case space. So this is the basic uh, theory behind centric encoding and how it helps us with MRA. And so what we get is we get our central lines of case space defined earlier, which means that we can then move our time of acquisition out here. So we start acquiring the case space data when the contrast is at its peak with the central case space acquired at this point here. This of course then brings a real problem if you do miss that center of case space, mistime it slightly, and you get these kind of ringing artifacts in the aorta because we've, we've just come a little bit too early and we haven't actually got uh, that case space that is not going to be acquired when the, when the contrast is in the aorta. These are the general um, means of uh, bolus triggering in real time so we can have your radiographer or your technician watching the contrast coming in using a low resolution image, multiple, multiply updated, uh, GE call it smart prep, Philips bolus track, Siemens care bolus. Another way we can sa sample the center of case space earlier is we can use a spiral or elliptical centric type uh, case space encoding. So we start at the center of case space and then work out. So this further concentrates the, the contrast defining lines being earlier on in the sequence because we're not sampling these ones out here at the same time. Okay, so we can, we can sort of visualize it this way that we're centering, we're collecting our center of case space during the peak arterial and then we can further do the, the edges of case space out here when the venous phase is happening, and we're not going to see this venous peak. So that means that we can, we can lengthen with a kind of spiral acquisition or whatever, elliptic centric, whatever you want to call that. We can move that, and we can further extend our sequence out here. We can collect more edge data out here and make a better sequence, make a better angiogram, uh, because we're not going to see that venous peak. Okay? We're going to still suppress that venous peak. This is Centra, this is a Philips uh, recessed case space where we, we, they have a pseudo-random acquisition around the center, um, so for the first four seconds or so of the sequence, and then we only do the very, very center of case space when we're pretty sure we're going to be in a more of a plateau phase of the contrast enhancement, and then we'll go on to the edges of case space, and we don't actually acquire the lines uh, right around the edge, so we have a case space shutter for that. So in an elliptical centric uh, recessed exam exa example, then we make sure that this little peak comes out somewhere here, which I mean, I've got a rather peaky graph here, but it will hopefully be more of the plateau area. 
And using these kind of things, then we can do contrast-enhanced MRA all the way down, and we can get very high spatial resolution at the small vessels down here where we need it compared to the larger vessels up here. Um, and hopefully, without too much venous contamination, hopefully, I say, though some patients will have such quick arterial venous transit down here that that will not always work. So what about if we want to actually acquire dynamically? We want to see different phases of the contrast passage through the arterial bed. So this is, this is, this is actually a very, very early. This isn't real dynamic MRA. This is done with uh, ordinary, uh, I think not even, not, not even centric case space encoding, basically uh, standard case space encoding. Patient with an aorta bifemoral graft in the first pass arterial phase and then later filling of these retrograde aneurysms in the pelvis on this examination here. So multiple examinations. Each of these is about 15 seconds of acquisition. So it's not really what we'd call dynamic, uh, but it's a kind of pseudo-dynamic. It's the first kind of example that we did uh, back in Glasgow many years ago. But the idea of what we call time-resolved imaging is basically going faster. We've heard about uh, parallel imaging um, and view sharing keyhole, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We've heard to talk about sense and grappa earlier on. I'm going to go really over this apart from to say that I believe this is the first 3D contrast enhanced MRA um, that was ever done. Uh, this is uh, from a paper we published in uh, JMRI. Uh, uh, Prisman and Weiger came over and uh, hooked up some bits and pieces to our scanner and injected me, this is my renal arteries, uh, with contrast. And this was a 40 second breath hold that we got multiple phases of contrast passage through the renal vasculature um, and never seen it before, which is a pure venous image before arterial circulation. But it's one 40-second breath hold, and we managed to get multiple 3D data sets. That was just purely using sense acceleration, parallel imaging, to, to get that, that uh, acceleration. But then uh, we've moved on now to view sharing techniques. So thanks to Lisbeth for giving this slide. This is uh, Philip's version, basically marketed as 4D track, where we take a mask image that's got the whole of case space. We then update the center of case space, and then at the end, we'll take one uh, disk of the edge of K-space, and then we'll share that disk with all the other parts here to give multiple um, reconstructions to give us a, an image that's got, got both center and peripheral of K-space uh, dynamically. And we can then end up with multiple really fast, temporally resolved uh, images through the contrast passage with uh, going from early arterial through peak arterial and out into venous. So GE uh, came to market with TRIX. This is one of the first iterations of this. There's different schema for sampling the case space and sampling the edge of case space and putting it all back together. Um, they all give roughly the same result at the end, despite the way they, they work. This is a GE example with a, a, a forearm examination. So we've got beautiful arterial and then the venous component at the end. So we can always fr frame out a particular uh, arterial part of that. Twist is the Siemens uh, version of this. It has a slightly different case space um, it mixes up little, little different parts of the edges of case space. Uh, they feel it's more robust. We have this on many of our systems. Um, the advantage of these is they are very robust. They work really, really well. Uh, we run them actually on absolutely everybody. We do contrast-enhanced MRA for the lower limbs uh, because so we can always get a pure arterial phase. It runs on absolutely everybody, no matter how severe their disease, uh, and we get good images, and it saves us um, from uh, getting venous contamination. Of course, it works in other parts of the body. So this is uh, the thorax. Here's a patient with a dissection showing it is a true 3D uh, examination. So we've got the, the true lumen fully filling before the false lumen, in this case of a uh, dissection of the descending thoracic aorta. It also works in the head. Uh, we can use it for looking at uh, AVMs and things in the brain. And we can get uh, very good in correlation with uh, DSA as a non-invasive examination. Up until now, uh, the paradigm for certainly for peripheral contrast enhanced MRA is that we subtract a mask image. So we take a mask image before we give the contrast and we subtract it from the contrast enhanced image to give us slice by slice a subtraction image where we only have the contrast so that we can then do an MIP overview to give these kind of images uh, that we have here where we get really good contrast to noise. The problems with this are that we can get misregistration if the patient moves their legs or whatever between the acquisition of the mask and subsequently then we'll get, uh, we'll get misregistration and it won't fully suppress. The advantage of subtraction is 
that we get uh, better contrast to noise and the further we go down in the legs particularly the, the smaller the vessels are in relation to the amount of fat that we've got potentially obscuring them uh, and it really is uh, useful it really is uh, you, you can't really look at an overview MIP certainly of the lower limbs um, without subtraction but what if you don't use subtraction anymore so these these are slides from Tim so what Tim's been working on is removing these mask images okay what if you don't need those mask images and we don't need those mask images if we have some kind of intrinsic fact suppression in our sequence so Tim's group um, have published work using a Dixon approach to the fat suppression we still get a little bit of anatomy but the 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 the, the surgeons like the anatomy um, but you get much better uh, overview images of the whole arterial tree all the way down and we get rid of some of the misregistration artifacts that you will see with uh, standard subtraction. What about blood pool contrast agents where we've got something that just stays in the blood pool forever and ever? Uh, the advantage of these is we can get very high spatial resolution because we're not worried about how long we're taking to, to acquire the images and we also get information about the veins which the surgeons actually really like. Gada phosphoset was the first commercially available of these, now actually off the market, uh, but it bound to albumin, had a very high, high specific relaxivity when it was bound to albumin um, and gave us beautiful images. If you look at the overview MIP, it doesn't look like very much because we've got so much vein in the way, but there's such high spatial resolution that you can actually distinguish uh, the, the arteries from the veins and we can use vessel tracking software to pull the arteries out from the veins and do curved planar reformats. And of course, the surgeons really like seeing the veins because they, they know that they can use these veins for their bypass surgery. Here's a patient with clippal Trenorni syndrome, very high spatial resolution, 0.5 millimeter isotropic. No matter which way you slice this data, the, the data is the same. Okay. It was mentioned earlier on using ferromoxetol, uh, ferrohem, to do the same thing. This is an iron based, ultra small paragmatic iron oxide, um, and it stays in the blood pool from maybe 15 hours or so. So we can inject a patient and we can image for as long as we want, send them away for lunch, bring them back and do it again. Here's some work we've done. This is the steady state image. So we've got the arteries and the veins enhanced. You can, even with a relatively slow infusion, uh, get first pass imaging. So this is first pass imaging prior to that. And if we subtract a first pass from the arterial and venous, then we get pure venous images. Again, the surgeons like these. This is slides from Paul Finn. This is using ferromoxetol. This is a first pass MRA, okay, on here. Here's the steady state where we've got the arteries and the veins. And here we've got an even longer acquisition. So what we've done here, we've done, uh, we've got respiratory motion correction and cardiac motion protect, uh, uh, cardiac motion uh, compensation. And we get a, a beautiful angiogram of the whole thing. Obviously we've got the arteries and the veins enhanced, but with modern post-processing software, you can segment out the bits you want to see and give overview images. So these are courtesy of Paul, Paul sent me these put in my talk. This is a patient with a complex dissection, patient with advanced renal failure, uh, but beautifully shows the whole thing all the way from top to bottom. And again, as I say, the veins. The veins are really, really useful. Veins are difficult to image with other modalities. And here we can see a patient with a transplant kidney in the pelvis, but they've, through previous venous access, they've lost their SVC and they've got all these collaterals. So in summary, although there is some uh, concern about NSF and gadolinium retention issues, uh, we've, they, that's driven us to uh, reduce the amount of contrast we need to use and using things like fat suppression and parallel imaging means that we can use lower amounts of CAD based contrast we tend to add functional information virtually to all our examinations using dynamic or time resolved component and we also use a high spatial resolution imaging so that we get the venous uh, imaging so that our, our, our surgeons actually are increasingly rely on so this is a slide from Tim because uh, he wanted to say diagnostic DSA is history. Uh, I think it is diagnostic. We shouldn't have to do diagnostic arteriography these days. Um, it really shouldn't have to be done. Thank you very much.